We're going to have a short discussion with a panel of uh, C4 scientists regarding this recent landmark uh, decision and signing of an agreement on the SPLK between the Government of Indonesia and the European Union. Um, with me on this panel are senior scientist Christoph Obizinski, uh, senior researcher Ahmed Damawan, scientist Harry Punomo, and senior scientist Paolo Ciruti, all of whom have been involved in the implementation of a project, a uh, research project managed by C4 called ProFormal, funded by the European Commission in five countries in the Congo Basin, Indonesia and Ecuador, which has been exploring the implications of the development of VPAs vis-a-vis -vis the domestic timber trade in particular. Before uh, the C4 scientists will comment on this uh, achievement, I would just like to make a few comments to acknowledge this uh, breakthrough uh, in terms of the signing of the VPA between the Government of Indonesia and the European Union uh, and to stress that it is a major achievement, particularly given the fact that the process <coughs> of negotiation under a multi-stakeholder platform that's involved many actors representing government, civil society, private sector industry and many others has taken almost a decade to get to this point. During that process there have been many ups and downs and more recently, even trial shipments. Uh, I think Christoph will be able to confirm this. I think 11 companies actually sent trial shipments earlier this year or at the end of last year through to the European market. But in addition, I'd like to try and highlight that there are a number of caveats to this achievement, particularly in terms of some of the recognized, I think now by a number of different groups, uh, weaknesses within the SVLK arrangement. One relates to the fact that if timber is produced on land where there are existing or earlier claims and hence associated conflicts, there are no mechanisms to ensure that these conflicts are, re are actually addressed um, in relation to the provisions of the licensing agreements to export timber to Europe. In addition, some of C4's own publications have raised concerns since 2011 on the proposed mechanism for monitoring which in essence involves civil society organizations but which we've highlighted in an earlier document has in a sense hollowed out the role of government in terms of its monitoring role and this is I think also something that is cause for concern. Thirdly the extent to which this mechanism will address the continued risks of corruption at many different layers of governance are not addressed through this mechanism. Fourthly, I think one of the concerns relates to some of the issues if timber is exported through a third party country before it enters the European Union market. <laughs> and here there are major weaknesses with the SVLK. Um, but where the backup in effect is the European Union timber regulation which came into force in March this year which still provides an insurance mechanism to ensure that any supply of timber may still be required to undertake additional due diligence to ensure that they can document the chain of custody from the origin of where this timber is produced to its ultimate sale in the European Union. A fifth and perhaps last point relates to the risks that this European Union timber regulation may be contested under the core prohibitions of the General Agreement on Trade and Tariffs, the World Trade Organization. And this is still a big question mark that has been raised in some current documentation that C4 is developing and will shortly be published. And Christoph will talk perhaps more about this. Lastly, I think we should also recognize, importantly, that this is one of a number of initiatives that are being addressed at different scales to tackle some of the major forest governance problems and challenges in Indonesia. This is very much Eurocentric because it's an initiative that was started in 2003 by the European Union under the Forest Law Enforcement Governance and Trade Arrangements. However, I think we should also recognize that as of earlier this year, the Anti-Corruption Commission in Indonesia has taken the lead in organizing an initiative which brings together eight ministries and four national agencies, including the National Land Agency, to try and improve the whole process of demarcating forested lands in this country, which lies at the core of many of the forest governance challenges, 
because it relates essentially to who owns the property on which forests stand, on which land can then be developed. In addition, I think we should recognize the efforts by many other countries outside of the European Union, particularly the United States in terms of the Lacey Act, the recent promulgation by the Australian Parliament of the regulations for the Australian equivalent, and other initiatives which are underway in South Korea, Japan, and New Zealand, amongst other countries. So this is just a short introduction. Um, and I would like now to hand over first to Christoph um, to add any additional points in terms of the experience we've had, and perhaps to say a little bit more about the work in progress, Christoph. Uh, thanks, Andrew. Uh, yes, I would like to follow up on s some points that uh, Andrew made already. And just wanted to reiterate that indeed, you know, this uh, signing of VPA by Indonesia constitutes a, a, an important achievement, <coughs> crowning, as, as he said, a, a, a 10 year long period of negotiation, formulation of uh, TLAS or Timber Legality Verification um, System and getting to the point of actually signing the agreement and verifying it. This is 10 years of kind of trying to find a way to address illegal logging, you know, figuring out how, how we get over this illegal logging problem and solve it at the international level once and for all. So uh, from that standpoint, that's kind of an you know, important achievement uh, for sure. Uh, it is also, I would like to say, an important achievement for, e for the EC, for, the, for Europe uh, uh, as well, because they've invested heavily into this FLECTI process and, and, and the VPA processes with various uh, supply countries. And it, it's really time for them now to, to show results and show that volumes of, of FLECTI certified timber uh, are, are flowing to Europe. So getting Indonesia on board is critical. It's really like, uh, you know, uh, something that they, that they really can be happy about. So from that standpoint, uh, you know, from the standpoint of these macro achievements, it, it looks good. But I would like to contribute a few things to the challenges uh, that I see. Um, Andrew mentioned already about these trial shipments that took place in November and December last year, and we followed uh, some information about these trial shipments. And indeed, uh, there have been 12 or 13, I think, companies that, uh, that have shipped uh, uh, timber under these new uh, uh, measures uh, under SBLK to Europe. And they've all been successful and you know, been heralded as, as a successful test and indi an indicator that everything is going to work fine. However, you know, what, we would like, what we would like to point is that um, all, of the, all 12 companies that sh ship this timber are essentially <coughs> well-established large companies with established uh, t systems for, for uh, verification and, and, and trade. And so um, we feel that perhaps the, the basing or, or extrapolating uh, from, from that small sample of well-established well companies to the whole sector is pr probably a, a little bit optimistic. Uh, the other observation comes from our study here uh, in, the, in Indonesia under the, under the project, uh, under proformal project, and, uh, at, and it relates to to, to this timber legality veri verification system, SBLK. Uh, one aspect that we find worrying is uh, that uh, the size of the small scale sector in the country. Our research has shown that uh, the size of the small scale sector, small scale logging and processing of timber in Indonesia is, is very large and is uh, grossly underestimated by the official statistics. Um, so, uh, so the new system will try to incorporate all these players and bring them into the fold of the formal economy. Um, the, the, there is a number of uh, um, proce processes that will take place to do that. There will be uh, monitoring, there will be, uh, um, there will be some financing made available to these uh, business units to bring them into the uh, formalization fold. But there also con continue to be questions of costs. Um, uh, some of the medium and larger companies may be able to handle these costs of additional uh, costs associated with formalization better than small scale players. There's also the, another initiative rolled out by the government uh, for group certification, particularly for the small scale uh, processor, processors of timber. There are some signs of success in Java, but overall it is still very, very small. You know, we are talking. 
uh, on the order of 40 to 50 business units being certified via group certification process, while uh, according to our estimates in Indonesia, we probably have something like 600,000 small-scale business units um, in, in, in Indonesia, essentially. Perhaps, Christoph, at that point, it might be a good idea if we could ask Harry to give and share some of his experiences from another research project which has been funded by the Australian government in North and Java in Japara about the successes that you've had in your project in terms of this collective action to, to meet the challenge of the excessive costs of verification to obtain an SVLK license. Yes, Harry. Thank you, Andrew. Simon of the uh, SVLK gave a threat as well as opportunity. Threat, it means if the SME, uh, for instance, the uh, furniture small scale uh, producer, cannot comply with this criteria as SVLK, then millions of people will lose their job, their source of income. And it also gives opportunities to secure uh, wood material, to secure the furniture industry, for instance, at Jepara. So the problem is how to make the small scale producer, which uh, actually use the legal wood, comply with the uh, requirement of SVLK. That's why we have been working in Jepara, Central Java, to facilitate them step by step, to understand the SVLK process, especially the uh, documentation process, because usually the uh, small scale enterprise do not actually document where the wood coming from, where the, uh, the forest that the wood coming from is uh, come. So uh, they don't actually wear the, the wood. So step by step, we uh, facilitate the, uh, the uh, process of compliance with the SVLK. And finally, we succeeded. And some of them, my group, um, get the SVLK certificate. And again, if individual is too expensive for them to get a certificate, but together, by as Andrew mentioned, collective action, they can comply. But it's not easy, it need to be step by step. But this is only uh, around nine producers. In Japan itself, we have 12,000 of small scale. 12,000. 12,000 of small scale furniture producers. So a long time to go to make the SME able to uh, take a benefit from the uh, yeah. SVLK. Thank you very much, Harry. And I think that, that raises, Christoph, to come back to you, one of the other big challenges, which is, to the best of my knowledge, Indonesia currently has only 11 registered validators for the verification process. And in a country of this size and with, as you said, more than 600,000 small and medium enterprises, it doesn't take rocket science to realize that it's going to take a long time to get all these producers with SVLK licenses. So how do you think, uh, Christoph, that the government with its development partners will be able to address this particular challenge? Well, I think uh, that they will take a two-pronged approach. On, on one hand, uh, they're doing whatever they can to increase the number of verifiers. Um, uh, I think at the, end of th at the beginning of this year it was around 12. Now it's, I think, maybe 15 or 16 already. That but still, I mean, it's, uh, it's, it's not a significant difference, even though the numbers are increasing. So on one hand, they will, there will be resources made available to train more uh, companies and, um, and, and verifiers of timber legality. Uh, that's on one hand. As I understand, on the other hand, that what the government is trying to do is to focus on just major key companies, large and medium companies, um, which account for, for the majority share in, in the export, in, in the trade and export of timber. Uh, so um, that, that will, that, that it seems to me that it will leave the, the small scale players kind of f later on f down the road. It will push them a little bit to the side and they, they will kind of be left over to be verified and certified later on uh, in the process. Um, but uh, uh, you know, there, there's an additional uh, aspect to this as well. I mean, on one hand, we've got this shortage of verifiers. On the other hand, as well, there are voices that are concerned that some of these verifi that some of these verifiers actually may have a conflict of interest as well built into their work 
because uh, of their background that you know some of these companies originally did uh, <laughs> forestry work they were essentially forest trading companies so so they are very intimately connected to some of these uh, business enterprises which are trading now uh, so there are various dimensions to it, but I think the government will try to prioritize and they will try to increase the numbers of these verifiers as much as they can. Okay. Thanks very much, Christo. Ahmed, would you, would you like to say a few words about some of the complementary efforts that the government of Indonesia has taken to address some of these broader forest governance challenges, which are obviously associated with um, the anti-corruption efforts and efforts to improve the demarcation of the forest estate? Yeah, sure. Thanks, Andrew. Um, I would like to say that um, like, uh, this VPA signing between EU and Indonesia is one part of a larger effort carried out by the Indonesian government to improve the forest governance. Um, I think we, we heard that, like we may know that uh, two or three years ago, this initiative to, to develop a one map uh, uh, system for the country and it, it, has, it has been like going on and to the best of my knowledge the uh, a, a map with a with a better scale will be published sometime around um, mid of next year in addition to that KPK has been like monitoring key ministries uh, which have been involved in land use and one of the review is published in 2010 as well, where KPK reviewed the Ministry of Forestry's uh, uh, mapping uh, system, so to speak. And they have found like uh, challenges and weaknesses in the system. And the KPK has been asking the Ministry of Forestry to improve their their land. And moreover, like as Andrew mentioned earlier, the KPK has recently engage with eight ministries and four agencies to sign an MOU to, to improve their demarcation of the land. Mm -hmm. And on the, on, on the other side, like we, we know that like in, May, in May this year, the, the Constitutional Court has issued a, a decision to exclude indigenous forests out of state forests, which in one sense could clarify could help clarify the, 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 the demarcation of forest lands, mm -hmm. but it also creates challenges in some areas, for example in Papua, where communities claim that the whole island is claimed as being uh, an indigenous land. So there are challenges with the ministry to, uh, to solve that issue. Okay. Thanks very much, Ahmed. Now moving on, Paolo. You've been involved and responsible for the pro formal project uh, focusing in terms of your own work more in the Congo Basin. Um, would you like to add another dimension of the significance of this achievement vis-a-vis, -vis, for example, the VPAs that have already been signed in a number of countries in Africa, and how you would compare the progress in the two different contexts that have been made in terms of trying to improve governance in the forest sector in the countries you've been working in? Yeah. I think the, the, the major difference is that Indonesia uh, if I'm not wrong, the, the launch of the SVLK, or at least the, the, the planning of the SVLK, was already ahead of the DPA negotiation. Mm -hmm. So it was something that the government already had in, in its own mind. Mm -hmm. And one of the weakest points that has been proven to be in Central Africa, and also in Western Africa, is exactly this uh, traceability system, if you want. Uh, uh, th the scheme, the VPA uh, have already been signed in, uh, in several countries, but none of them has been able today to put in place one uh, secure traceability system to check the timber from harvesting to export could be given a, a flag license. So that's the major difference. One similarity, uh, conversely, is that the small scale logging sector is also a big part of, of the forestry sector, of the more general forestry sector. So um, efforts, are, it has been included in all the VPA that have been signed to date, uh, except the Central African Republic, but it's still a, a major challenge for the government uh, as a question. So how, how do we include that into 
the VPA into the, the traceability system, the legality assurance system, etc. Because this is completely different from the industrial sector. It's uh, hundreds of, well, dozens of thousands of people uh, working mostly independently. Uh, so from micro to mid uh, industries, and and it's very difficult to to control their activities, to check whether the timber is harvested legally, illegally, um, and and then also they they basically don't ask for legal logging title because it's too difficult for the moment in the legal frameworks to come to the count to the to the capital cities and ask for these titles. Um, I don't know how Indonesia is trying to solve this problem, but in, in, in at least in Africa, Central and Western Africa is still a, a major, a major dimension. Mm -hmm. So the, the legal framework is still very weak vis-a-vis -vis these uh, these producers. I think, uh, Paolo, it, it's a very important point, and, uh, and I think there are parallels in Indonesia in terms of even the extent to which the small and medium enterprises are recognized. Mm -hmm. uh, as Christoph has said, the predominant focus is on producers who produce more than 6,000 cubic meters of timber a year, uh, whereas most of our small and medium enterprises are producing anything between 25 and 250 cubic meters. This can still be garden furniture that's being exported to Germany or France or to the European market, but it's on the scale of family businesses, so a small number. And I think the key point that you've alluded to, Paolo, is that the risks with any system of traceability which is going to reinforce the egality or illegality associated with those production systems, risk possibly pushing lots of people into a, a zone of being considered as criminal, um, but which in fact represents major sources of income to sustain the livelihoods, as Harry was saying in Japara. This, these are 12,000 enterprises. Behind each enterprise, you might have 10 family members. So it's Hundreds of, for hundreds of thousands of people, these represent major sources of income. So this is something that I think we have to be cautious about in terms of how it's going to be enforced. So I hope this has given you some idea of the achievements that have been made over the last 10 years and all credit due to the government of Indonesia and the European Union for what has now been signed. There are still many challenges ahead uh, and we hope that C4 as it has done already significantly in the Central African region, will continue to contribute to this debate through our research in Indonesia, Central Africa, and we hope increasingly in Latin America. Thank you very much.